This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Larry Bailey, Michelle Sergio, and Miss Music Teacher. Coming up on DTNS, Sony named its car Afila. That's the name of the car. The scoop on AMD's rise in announcements and wireless power to metaverse to hydroponics. Rich Strafalino rounds up some of his favorites from CES. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, January 5th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From the fabulous Las Vegas Convention Center, I'm Rich Straffolino. And from my bedroom, I'm the show's producer, Roger. <laughs> you know, we've been remiss in not thanking our on-site producer at Las Vegas, uh, Amos, a.k.a. Anthony Lemos. Uh, so big round of applause for Amos doing yeoman's work out there in Las Vegas. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We got lots to get to, so let's start with the, this time, non-CES quick hits. Amazon CEO Andy Jassy emailed employees that the company will eliminate approximately 18,000 jobs in both the Amazon stores and people, experience, and technology organizations starting January 18th. Apple launched a digital narration option for audio versions of ebooks it sells, starting with literary, historical, and women's fiction, with more fiction categories and nonfiction in the works. Don't worry, nonfiction fans. Authors can choose from four voices so far. Two sopranos, Madison and Jackson, are trained to read romance and fiction, while baritones Helena and Mitchell are trained to read self-development and nonfiction. NOLA.com reported Monday that at the end of November, a 28-year-old black man in DeKalb County, Georgia, was mistakenly arrested and jailed for six days on suspicion of theft in Louisiana because of mistaken facial recognition. I'm a big stickler for like, okay, but have the mistakes been made? Here it is. A mistake definitely made. In June last year, a man was caught on camera in relation to a theft of around $10,000 worth of luxury goods. The Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office in Louisiana issued an arrest warrant based on a facial recognition match, or so they thought. Jefferson Parish Sheriffs have not commented on the case, but in previous cases have used analysis through the Louisiana State Analytic Infusion Exchange in Baton Rouge, which uses Clearview AI, you may have heard of them, and MorphoTrack systems. Roku announced it now has more than 70 million active accounts worldwide, up 10 million on the year. It also reported a 19% rise in streaming hours on the year. Bruce Schneier reports that Chinese researchers have published a paper detailing a method for using a quantum computer to break 2048-bit RSA. You know, like the most secure RSA. <laughs> The bad news is the researchers found a workaround that lets them factor a large key size on a smaller quantum computer than people thought would be needed, uh, one with at least 372 qubits. The good news, though, is that the paper relies on Peter Schnorr's factoring method that appears to fall apart at large sizes, so the method may not work in practice. Schneier points out that IBM has the means to test this in real life uh, because it has a 433 qubit IBM Osprey quantum computer. Mm. Nikkei sources say Dell has told its suppliers to meaningfully lower the amount of components made in China in an effort to diversify its supply chain. Dell's goal is to have all chips used in its products made outside of China by 2024. Nikkei sources say HP has looked at the possibility of a similar move. All right, that's the non-CES stuff. Now for the CES news. Let's start with Sony's big press event on Wednesday night. Yeah, Sony has been showing off concept electric cars at CES for a few years now. Not an unfamiliar sight. Last year, it announced that Honda would actually make its cars. This year, it's giving us a name for those cars, Afila. And the first pre-orders for Afila are planned to begin in the first half of 2025, with sales to begin that same year and shipments to North America to come by spring 2026. I feel you. I mean, Afila is the name. <laughs> Sony also says it is working on an accessibility controller kit for the PlayStation, codenamed Project Leonardo. Sony has been working with Able Gamers and Special Effect on the design. Uh, Leonardo has a PlayStation face and trigger button setup, so you can move the, you know, the zero and the square and the SF. The, those can all be repositioned around a circular gamepad. The joystick can also be repositioned relative to that gamepad. It has four 3.5 millimeter auxiliary 
theory jacks. You can add some third-party accessories. It can be used alone or paired with an existing DualSense controller. And users can map functions to the various buttons and save up to three configurations on the device. No word on a release date yet. And Sony also showed us a sneak peek at the Gran Turismo movie being directed by Neil Blomkampf, it, which is uh, going to hit theaters on August 11th. Oh, and Sony says it sold 30 million PS5s, and the PS5 shortage is over. Just, oh, the PS5 so you know. shortage is over. Woo, our long national nightmare. How many people immediately said they couldn't get a PS5 after <laughs> that, that? That was the uh, the tweet or the tweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, the, the Sony announcements were fine. Uh, it seems like they just make a new car, like a little bit of progress every year on the car right <laughs> just, it's like now we get the name so yeah um, spoon feeding you we i mean I, I got to see it i got to go up and uh it's it's an impressive uh looking vehicle very uh tesla looking i would say in a lot of ways but definitely it doesn't look like a honda i guess that's what i was expecting uh mm -hmm. kind of going up there it definitely falls into more of i guess what we've seen in ev design uh so yeah. far but, yeah, uh, Sony's designing it. Honda's just building it to Sony's specs. So yeah, yeah. it would that, that that makes sense that it would would look different. Uh, and and yeah, they can make it look any way they want when they don't have to actually ship it. So <laughs> that's true. Very, very yeah. curious what it'll look like in the end. Absolutely. All right, now for some CES news that matters, as in the Matter Smart Home uh, protocol. By the way, if if you're wanting a little update on Matter, uh, if you're like, I just need a little more depth. I, I know Norm Fazikas was asking some questions in the Discord earlier. Uh, go to to know a little more.com. I have a great interview with Stacey Higginbotham about what matter is. Uh, and we did an episode on thread, the thread protocol that kind of explains border gateways and all that sort of thing. Uh, Samsung announced the smart things station that acts as a matter and thread compliant smart home hub, AKA if you've listened to that episode, I just mentioned a border router, uh, while also being a 15 watt wireless charger. So you have another reason to have it in your room. It's a flat square device, has one button. You can program that button to trigger smart things scenes. So for instance, uh, single click, double click, or long press for a different automation. You can also program things to happen when you put something on the pad to charge. For instance, you could put a phone on the charger, say after 11 p.m., and it would automatically turn off the lights, lock the doors, and adjust the thermostat because that's the signal you're going to bed. Also works with smart things find so that if you double press the button, at least by default, it'll ring your Galaxy phone. Uh, it can also scan for Galaxy devices, Galaxy Smart Tags, and Smart Tag Plus. Sports Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and Z-Wave. So even if you're not worried about matter, if you're in the Z-Wave universe, it would work for you. Launching in Korea first, uh, then following in the U.S. in February for $60, or if you want a USB-C adapter for it, $80. Uh, th I think this is brilliant, Rich, because it, it's a charger. So you, you, you'll want to put these things in more places in, in your home than if it was just the, the router. Yeah, and we're going to talk about another piece of tech that kind of is like kind of the the expansion of of where we can put like, you know, these these uh, border routers uh, in homes is like, you know, shoving it in other things because the technology is cheap enough that we can do that. And, you know, 60 to 80 bucks, that's on the high end for like a nice uh, wireless charger, but it's not completely out of the realm of that. Uh, so I, I don't even feel like there's that much of a price premium, given that you're getting some pretty interesting features here. Yeah. All right, well, so in other news, Apple, Google, and Samsung have all pushed out their Matter compliance. That left Amazon. And Wednesday, Amazon announced Matter over thread support will come to Echo and Aero devices this spring and expand to Amazon's smart home devices as well. Basically, everything but first-gen Echoes will get it. Sorry, first-gen Echo owners. And Amazon's Alexa app for iOS will be updated for it as well. Once Amazon updates, Matter will finally become fully cross-platform. Are you excited, yeah. Tom? I am actually. This this is a long time coming. Uh, Matter is going. We've we've talked about it before. It's going through the same thing that Bluetooth and even USB did. Where while it's being rolled out, everybody's confused and it doesn't work everywhere. And ah, oh, do I have to get a driver for it? All that stuff. And then eventually, it just becomes a standard and it, and it just works all the time. Uh, this is one of those milestones on the way to Matter just being the thing that works all the time. And I I'd, I'd guess uh, because we now have it all there. In two years, uh, smart home stuff is just something you don't have to think about compliance-wise. You, you just buy the smart home stuff, and it works with whatever you got. Yeah, I, I was kind of worried about that that those early stages, but then yeah. I had to remind myself that we're coming from, from no cross-compatibility to some cross-compatibility. So people that are interested in this are going to, like, it's a benefit that was not there, even if 
it's incomplete and we're still kind of in these early stages right now. So I feel like that's worth it for people that value it already to put up with kind of these, you know, early growing pains for this. The bigger thing that I think with Matter going forward, now that we have this cross compatibility is like, we, we're already starting to see some non feature parity, like everything will work with your hubs, but there's some like feature stuff between Android and iOS that we're seeing from some manufacturers. I think that's the more interesting story with matter uh, in, in terms of growing pains going forward. Yeah. The, the, the sort of the fenced off areas like, yeah. Oh, it'll work with matter, but if you want the special automation, mm-hmm. you got to use yeah. home kit or yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're gonna have a lot of conversations about that. Uh, this, this final bit is not exactly matter related. It's matter adjacent. Uh, Amazon's sidewalk mesh network uses, its devices, like your Echo or your Ring camera, to create a very low bandwidth mesh network. We've talked about it. It's very fenced off. Uh, I know Amazon has lacking a lot of trust in people that this this is fairly well done. And you can turn it off if you're really worried about it, but it uses virtually no bandwidth. But what it does is it uses just enough to connect small Internet of Things devices to each other to create an ad hoc network for low bandwidth communication. Tile trackers use it. Level smart locks use it. Careband senior systems use it. And Amazon announced Wednesday that they've got a bunch of new partners that aren't relying on home users. So enterprise Wi-Fi product maker Broen, gas leak detector maker New Cosmos, enterprise IoT company Meshify, and solar inverter maker Device Roy's Aria are all joining Sidewalk. More partners coming later this year. And Amazon says it will open Sidewalk to developers in an API kind of situation later this year. Yeah, if they can make that pitch and that use case, obviously they are to the enterprise and you can get where we have all these ambient sensors around that we don't know because they're weird B2B businesses that we've never heard of before. That's the big thing. My question is, when will we see Cisco and and like one of those where it's like, okay, that's everywhere, like literally everywhere. That'll be the next stage. I'm sure they're eyeing that at some point. Yeah, Sidewalk is going to be useful for for just making some ambient low low stuff possible where you can throw sensors in your yard or on your car and and you don't have to worry about internet connectivity, right? They, you mm. just want small bits of data passing around. Uh, it's always been a, a, a thing where like, well, if we're just relying on echoes, what if not enough people in a neighborhood have an echo? And, you know, how is that going to work? So these kinds of partners make, oh, they're going to fill in big blocks of the map by bringing these people on. And, yeah, if they bring on a Cisco conversation over. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, there's uh, always a spate of interesting CES announcements. There's just a ton of them out there. Here's a couple, though, that kind of stood out, caught our eye. Yeah, Lenovo. Uh, These are all from Lenovo. Lenovo, which owns Motorola, has introduced a Lenovo ThinkPad branded phone called the Lenovo ThinkPhone by Motorola. Uh, they, they got all the words in. Uh, it looks like a Motorola phone in the front, has a ThinkPad style logo and Kevlar on the back. I, there's a mullet joke in there somewhere, I'm sure. The customizable side button is red, so it's not a ThinkPad track point, but it, it's a nod to it. Uh, it's a solid 6.6-inch OLED phone, uh, IP68 water resistance, in-screen fingerprint sensor, all the standard Motorola enterprise management stuff. There's nothing particularly ThinkPad-y about it, but it's pre- a pretty standard phone. That's that's my problem with it. I want more think pattiness to it. I want the round actual track point. Don't just make it the color. Give me all the ThinkPad things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another interesting thing, Lenovo product, is the ThinkBook 16P. It has a magnetic connector on the top called the Magic Bay for popping modules on and off. Lenovo has three Magic Bay modules. It will sell you when you buy the laptop, a 4K webcam on a rotating hinge that can combine with the built-in webcam that's 1080 to optimize the image for $150, an LTE pack for $99, and a selfie light for $20. Yeah. I think Book 16P comes in May, starting at $1,350. Mod- modules have never failed Lenovo. Motorola, maybe, but never <laughs> Lenovo. Yeah, we'll see. They, they'll need those uh, there's also the Yoga Book 9i, which attaches two 13.3 inch 2.8K OLED screens with a 360 degree hinge. So you know, like a like a triptych. Uh, you, you can you can make it really tall. Uh, you could make it a really wide screen. You could fold it up like a laptop and just use one screen, and then snap the included Bluetooth keyboard over part of the other screen. If you put it up at the top, the bottom becomes a trackpad. Put it at the bottom, the top becomes another part of a smaller screen. Comes with an active pen for note taking as well, and the included carrying case doubles as a stand. Starts at twenty one hundred dollars shipping in June. 
There's also the ThinkBook Plus Twist, a new version of the laptop with an e-ink screen on the lid that now swivels so you can switch between the OLED and e-ink screens without closing the laptop. It's coming in June for $1,650. I almost want to just buy this to use Windows on an e-ink screen because <laughs> you, you can do that. Because you enjoy that. pain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lenovo has a 10.3-inch e-ink tablet as well called the Smart Paper. So this is another entry in that Kindle Scribe remarkable space mm -hmm. of e-ink notepads. Has a neat feature, though, that the others don't. Otherwise, it's pretty similar. Uh, it can record what audio is being said as your notes are made. The, the others can, I think the remarkable can definitely do audio, but I don't think it automatically records a snippet as you're making the note. Uh, so it's in, it's easy to get some extra clarity on your scribbles. If you're like, well, why was I writing that? You can like play back what it, you were hearing at the time. Comes with the pen, case, and 50 gigabytes of storage as well for $399.99, shipping later this year. Yeah, interesting pricing kind of in between the cheapest and more expensive uh, scribe. And I love that they're emulating Microsoft smart pen technology from like 2005 with that. <laughs> Yeah, it's got some advantages with that that hefty storage uh, and including the pen. Oh yeah, uh, but yeah, it's it's price is not super cheap. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It seems like e everybody's racing into this space though. As an e ink stand, first of all, give me my color e ink ten point three inch screen. I know it's going to be like nine hundred dollars. I still yeah. want it, but I'm just happy to see like we haven't given up on e ink because it's just a cool power saving technology. It's good for these kind of things. Once we get the refresh rates kind of figured out. Yeah, and if CES is behaving the way it usually does. Uh, uh, you'll go to Showstoppers tonight, and Lenovo will have all this stuff out. I am, like that's, I'm that's generally how this works. <laughs> all right, folks, uh, don't miss out. We have a special audio interview Rich recorded with CES spokesperson Tina Anthony coming to patrons this Saturday. They discuss the tech trends from this year's show and how attendance has beat organizers' expectations. It's free for everyone to listen to on our Patreon site. So even if you're not a patron, head over there to listen to it, patreon.com slash DTNS this Saturday. All right, let's dig into the big AMD announcements. Yeah, AMD announced the 7600, 7700, and 7900 CPUs that cost 229 $329 and $429, respectively, you guessed it. Compared to CPUs with an X after the model number, these have a lower 65-watt TDP and slightly lower clock speeds and bundled CPU coolers, because you're not going to probably be doing crazy overclocking with these. All three will be available January 10th. On the other end of the price scale, for those <laughs> of you who are like, that's just not enough money for me to spend... Uh, <laughs> AMD announced three Ryzen 9 3D V-Cache processors, the 7800X 3D, 7900X 3D, and the 7950X 3D. So you want to compare these to the same model numbers that don't have 3D. Other, they're, they're pretty much the same, except the ones with 3D have an extra 64 megabytes of L3 cache stacked on top hence the 3D. That helps improve game performance, so these are mostly meant for gaming. No prices yet either, uh, but they are coming in February, and everybody is getting ready to try to benchmark these against the Intel Core i9-13900K. We'll be looking out for those. AMD also announced new laptop Ryzen 7000 CPUs as well. The 7045HX series is the Dragon Range for high-end gaming and workstation laptops. It packs in 16 full-speed cores, essentially a reworked desktop CPU in a laptop. The 7040HS Phoenix series is a Zen 4 CPU combined with RDNA 3 integrated GPU on a 4 nanometer process. These come with a dedicated AI engine on board, something Intel won't get until Meteor Lake comes later this year. The other three series are uh, the other three series are rebranded of previously released chips. And AMD is also promising RTX 3060 level performance on laptops using its new Radeon RX 7600M XT GPUs. Uh, they have 32 teraflops of performance paired with 8 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. There's also a slightly less powerful 7600M just 7600M, that's coming too. New Alienware M18 and M16 laptops will both be available with the new GPUs. Uh, our producer, Roger Chang, uh, looked over all this stuff. I, I know, Roger, you you keep a close watch on, on the chip sector. What do you think of AMD's announcements from CES? Um, it's, it's, it's very telling that uh, this announcement follows uh, all the announcements from Intel, as well as AMD's uh, itself from last year. And this is just to kind of like say, hey, one more time, we do have competitive processors uh, out there, and for for the uh, for the CES uh, 
set, they basically introduced a bunch of chips that are going to be the bread and butter uh, of their operations, which is chips that go into laptops and uh, you know ready built PCs that you get from your Best Buys, from your online uh, uh, Dell stores. Um, you know, until they get benchmark, we don't know how well they perform. But this is essentially saying like we now have all this good technology that we've just created and it will be reaching you in the various outlets in a in a tamer more affordable form um uh, it's 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 generally a positive for the consumer i think if you're if you're looking to buy uh, a pc laptop or a new pc later this year what about those uh the the desktop cpus the 229 dollar 429 dollars so what how did those hit you those those are really the that is kind of the mid mid range of where a lot of PC builders, especially even gamers, if you go go through Steam and you do the system analysis, they every year they pump pump out a report that tells you who has what, and uh, this will be part of that like seventy five percent of people who upgrade, they can probably upgrade to one of these, um, if not an Intel equivalent, because people do want performance, but they can't necessarily afford the top dollar that you get when you buy top of the line. All right. Well, thank you, Roger. Uh, it is time now for Rich Straffolino's Rich Roundup of interesting things that caught his eye at CES. I, I don't have an appropriate, uh, 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 you know, uh, jingle for you yet. But if this goes well, maybe next year we'll we'll have that. We'll need a cash register. I feel like yeah. that'll be appropriate. All right. So first up here, using radio frequency to deliver over the air wireless power isn't new. We've seen that before. But in the past, we've seen companies like Powercast use dedicated transmitters for sending out RF-based power. So you'd have thing that's just that transmitter sitting on a shelf somewhere near the thing you want to power. The company, though, that is uh, Powercast, announced a new $5 Ubiquiti transmitter chip, and it's designed uh, for OEMs. It's small, about the size of two poached stamps, and the idea is that it could be integrated into you know, any kind of electronics that you already have around your house, things like TVs, consoles, smart speakers, other devices, and to kind of create a wider RF power network using devices you're already going to buy for your house. In some ways, it reminds me of what we saw um, Samsung, we were talking about earlier, uh, mm -hmm. doing with uh, kind of their smart thing and, and matter integration into a wireless charger. Wireless charger would probably be a good thing uh, for this chip as well. It was just a very... Exciting. I know it's, you know, reference designs are not like the yeah. the, the most glamorous it's the announcements. It's the but. problem with wireless power is that it's always a reference design. It's always a thing that like we just need people to to implement <laughs> it. And 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 we're still waiting. There there was that lock that was going to use infrared power mm -hmm. to, yeah. to to keep the battery charged. They're selling it. They announced it at CES, but not with the wireless power. <laughs> so you can buy the lock. And then wait for the wireless charger to come out maybe later this year, we hope. Uh, so, so yeah, it's like I'm still waiting for the one to be like, and it's in a product that you can well, go and use today. Well, so the good thing is I can definitely see uh, – companies that are already going to be selling you the remote, right? So if you're a TV maker, if you're a game console maker, the idea is you're going to be, the, the remote comes in the box, right? So the, the problem is you don't have a chicken and egg problem, right? Where yeah, yeah. before you had to buy the thing that could receive the power and the transmitter separately. Now, instead, if they get partnerships with any kind of TV OEMs, you buy your Hisense TV, you put it on the wall and it's automatically charging your, you know, trickle charging your remote within a 15 foot range of your TV where you're always going to have it yeah. usually anyway, that to me, and, and then, then it works with a wider ecosystem of things. I could definitely see that, you know, slowly it's just a one-off thing. And then you realize, Oh, I can keep buying more things. Oh, my, my, uh, you know, my echo has this integrated in it as well and build that out and kind of just casually all of a sudden you have this network. That to me is the, the appeal to this and kind of what made it exciting. Yeah, get get it in a product. Come on, one of you OEMs. Announce, announce the partnerships. It. I know the reference yeah. design is fun. That's that's the news they're announcing. Yeah. So that's why they're at CES. I'm sure is to do all the B two B. It's it's such a CES thing, like because they're looking <laughs> for the partners. They yeah. they they, they want to get that out there. I totally get that. Uh, we we haven't heard enough people talking about the metaverse lately. Oh no, yeah, there's barely been scant news about the the metaverse here at CES. Well, uh, I was actually talking with uh, a company called Meetkai, and they announced uh, tools for building your metaverse apps and making it a little easier. One product is called the Meet, uh, is called Meet Kai Reality, which uses quick video footage clips to render a space in a 3D environment, all ready for VR. The more interesting product, though, is definitely Meet Kai Metaverse Editor, which, despite the name, maybe raising some eyebrows, lets someone build 3D structures and space without code. Kind of think of it, it reminded me very much of like a Squarespace website editor, but for 
like something in Second Life. Yeah, the yeah. company says it's using its AI background. It actually uh, was founded in 2018 to kind of do uh, AI voice synthesis to make building these spaces uh, with much higher pixel density and less resource intensive than other platforms. So you don't have to, you know, kind of crunch all those pixels at once. The AI can kind of infer that kind of stuff. It's also working on tools interacting in in the metaverse. So there's a Meet Kai Cloud AI that lets devs plug in voice assistants into virtual reality environments, letting avatars converse more easily with your voice assistant and just having a, you know, a, a better kind of chat interface while you're in there. Uh, definitely some interesting things. They're working with the Chargers to kind of build an e-commerce the, the, in the NFL to build out uh, like an e-commerce metaverse store oh. for them. The other thing that really interested me about them is they're they're very much platform agnostic and they're very focused on making this all available like through web browsers instead of locking it into app stores. In fact, I was talking to the CEO and it's pretty, um, seemed, I don't want to say hostile, but he seemed very ambivalent toward app stores from Meta and potentially Apple uh, getting involved in the metaverse space and very much was yay browsers, which made me happy. So is this cross-platform, could I could I build for yep. Decentraland or, you know, I guess Fortnite would need to let me in, but like you you could build it and if everybody's using what, like you, you, your universal scene description or something? It works. Right, right now they're saying it, it's, it's supposed to be compatible with any metaverse, any browser in the metaverse is the idea for this as okay. opposed to making it app-based uh, uh, going forward. Now, you know, if they make the right deals, that may change. I don't know, but that the, he, he's the the CEO, at least I was talking to, uh, seemed very dedicated uh, to that idea, which was encouraging me. All right. Uh, what about hydroponics? Yeah, mm -hmm. so we had Rise Garden. They announced a new smart hydroponic garden, the new Rise Garden. It's a very creative <laughs> name. Uh, it adds Amazon voice services integration. They've had uh, a Gen 1 out already, uh, but this one, like I said, adds uh, AVS, offers a larger removable reservoir. The other one was fixed in place and a lot smaller and just easier to assemble out of the box. You can stack three of these uh, on top of each other, and you can get a total of 108 plants. Uh, overall, so uh, you know, pretty uh, significant capacity. Using uh, 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 other updates include um, uh, things like seed pods that kind of plug in Keurig style to the system, so it knows what kind of watering and lighting conditions are mm -hmm. needed. Uh, but Rise, one of their differentiators over something like Aero Garden or some of the other uh, uh, kind of smart hydroponics is they also have like a pH balance system in there, so that'll allow it to support a wider variety of fruits and vegetables, other plants. Uh, we saw them growing like root vegetables, like they had radish uh, that was growing out there, which I have not seen uh, in other systems like that. So it's available now uh, for $750. That's for the one rack kind of, they call it the single family system, and you can go up to three racks tall on that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of these hitting the market now, uh, and I'm kind of hoping that they catch up catch on enough that, that you'll start to see some feature compatibility, you know, and comparisons between them uh, because they all sort of work differently and it's hard to tell whether it's worth the money or not and how much trouble you're going to have to do. So I'm glad we're seeing more of these. Uh, I, I know there was one other that caught your eye out there in the sous vide area. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, Typher, T-Y-P-H-U-R, announced the sous vide station. It's designed as a uh, all-in-one sous vide system. So instead of just getting like a circulator and you, you know, kind of get your own bucket and you have to have your own vacuum seat, uh, it's kind of all in one. It comes with a, a uh, 1,750 watt circulator, a handheld vacuum pump, which was super cool, and a 12.3 inch screen on top of its water tank. That uh, screen gives you access to obviously setting temperature and timers and stuff like that, but also comes with guides and recipes and allows you to kind of uh, cater your recipes to what you're actually cooking. So you can set the weight of your meat and it'll tell you, okay, how long you actually need to cook it, as opposed to a lot of like a lot of sous vide stuff feels very, especially on the lower end of the cost spectrum, feels a little on the hacky side where you're kind of guessing, you're kind of going off, uh, you know, forum threads and stuff like that to kind of figure out how to cook stuff. Uh, this is on the more expensive side. It is a more developed product. Pre-orders open soon at $700, but definitely it seemed like a very well-polished uh, system if you are mm. into the sous vide universe. And the fact that it gets you everything in yeah. one one. One shot, I think, is 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 attractive to people who are sous vide curious. Yes, and like the myself. vacuum pump. I cannot emphasize enough. I love that the handheld vacuum pump because I do not like like the vacuum sealer appliance. It's the worst. Well, folks, there's so much at CES. We try to bring you things that are most notable. So here we go with a lightning round of other interesting announcements. HTC opened pre-orders for the standalone Vive XR Elite VR headset at 625 grams. It's heavier than the Quest 2, 
but lighter than the Quest Pro. Has 2K pixels per eye, 110 degree field of view, adds a lens diopter adjustment so you don't need to wear your glasses. It won't just do the depth, it'll do some other stuff too. There's a small 10 minute battery so you can swap out the larger two hour battery in the back without having to power down. There's also a glasses mode that you can replace the strap and the battery with some plastic arms, brings the weight down to 240 grams, and then you have to wire it up for the power because you only got 10 minute battery life. But if you're going to sit at a laptop for a long time and you want to use that as a display, that's an option. It's $1,099 shipping in late February. Mercedes-Benz announced that it's partnering with ChargePoint and solar energy company MN8 to install 400 fast EV charging hubs in the U.S. with a total of 2,500 DC chargers. The hubs will be open to all EV owners through Mercedes owner, although Mercedes owners will get a chance at some limited reservations. Google is rolling out its split screen for Android Auto. Uh, this is the one that it previewed at Google I.O. Maps can stay on the screen now, uh, and you can have either one or two panes, or you can go back to a single pane, uh, and those other panes can show other info, like a podcast you're playing or reminders, calendar stuff, things like that. And still on the auto uh, automaker side, Google announced an HD version of Maps for Level 2 Plus and Level 3 Assisted Driving Systems. It lets those systems get info on precise lane markers, road signs, and traffic barriers, and other items to combine them, to combine them with information from sensors. The info will help systems in the uh, Volvo EX90 and Polestar 3 with more to follow. Google is working on cross-device playback notifications that use Bluetooth low energy, Wi-Fi, and ultra wideband so that if you're like moving between Android Auto, Google TV, and your Android phone, you can just seamlessly transfer what you're listening to from one to the other. So for instance, Android might notice that you left your house and offer to move audio from the TV to your phone. And then when you get in the car, move it to the car. Uh, Google is working on support for this for YouTube music, as you might guess, but also Spotify. Spotify. Uh, no word on when that will roll out. Razer's Switch-like Android handheld, the rated R Superstar Edge, is coming to Verizon January 26 for $359.99 with a plan. Retail uh, price without a subsidy would be $599.99. Or you can buy a Wi-Fi-only version for $399.99. It has a 6.8-inch OLED screen with a 144 hertz refresh rate. It supports Xbox Cloud Gaming, NVIDIA GeForce Now, and Streamlink. Uh, Steam Link, not Stream Steam Link. Link. Sorry, uh, yeah. my mind. Uh, Razer also announced the Leviathan V2 Pro for PC gamers. It uses an IR camera to track your head, so not a not a visual camera, but it can tell where your head is, uh, and then it can provide beam formed THX spatial audio, either speaker or headphone style. It includes a subwoofer too, and connects by USB C or Bluetooth. The Razer Leviathan V2 Pro starts at three hundred ninety nine dollars ninety nine cents. Available in February. And Razer promises its $300 Kyo Pro Ultra webcam can deliver uncompressed 4K video at 24 frames per second or 1440p at 30 frames per second. Legato can do 4K at 60 frames per second, but it's compressed, so you can see the advantage uh, for Razer here. It's available now. Now, a lot of you are saying, sure, laptops, cameras, what about farm equipment? Well, John Deere announced Exact Shot. I love, I love covering farm equipment on DTS. <laughs> uh, it's a new sensor and robotics based system for applying fertilizer. So it uses computer vision uh, to figure out how to spray the fertilizer only where the seeds have been planted. Uh, and that reduces the cost because you're not using as much fertilizer that then reduces runoff pollution and weed growth because you're not fertilizing the part where the weeds grow also announced a new electric excavator john deere is using a chrysal battery uh, and that will reduce the cost of operation of the excavator as well as the noise and the emissions all right, well, Schneider Electric makes the circuit breakers for 40% of U.S. households, which is a lot. The company is announcing an electrical panel, a solar inverter, a wall-mountable, stackable 10-kilowatt-hour batteries, an EV charger, and an array of smart outlets and light switches and dimmers. When you buy them together, they can do things like measure consumption at every outlet and every breaker and estimate which, devices is, or which device is using energy based on its electric signature. The first installations are expected 
this summer. Yeah, th- this is beautiful because it, you, it can work with third-party stuff or not. They're like, it's soft lock-in. It's like, hey, you can use this <laughs> with anything. But if you really want to tell everything that's going on in your home, we can deliver on that from the control panel. I, I thought that was lock you in with convenience. Here's something that probably doesn't seem as genius. Uh, Philips Hue is launching the Philips Hue Sync app for Samsung TVs. It can sync your Philips Hue smart lights to what is displayed on the TV, and it costs $130 for the app. Now, that is still less than the $250 it would cost for the HDMI Sync box that did the same thing. And the app on Samsung TVs will work with Netflix and Disney+. Plus. Uh, the box did not. In fact, it works with all image formats and TV content, uh, though The Verge points out that there is a competing product called the Govi Immersion Kit that will work with any TV and any content, includes a light strip and a camera, and the whole thing costs 80 bucks. And gadgets, uh, Sherilyn Lowe told us about Displace TV on the show Wednesday, and here are a few more details. It's a 55-inch 4K TV with wireless video transmission. A tower separate from the TV uses Wi-Fi 6E to send video to the screen, though no other details quite on that. A little murky there. The screen, however, is powered by hot swappable batteries, which should go a month on a charge. The screen weighs less than 20 pounds and attaches to any surface with suction cups and uh, presumably a lot of faith. A pop-up camera in the TV lets you control it with gestures using the same kind of technology that was used in the Microsoft Connect. You can use multiple screens together in sync as well. The Displace TV will ship later this year for $3,000. We looked for this on the show for I found their booth. They're having some trouble setting it up. So we'll see if we can uh, get a demo and maybe some was video. It, was up it on. not stuck into the wall? I, no, it was sticking to the wall. It just okay, wasn't, okay. Sink, wasn't sinking. So. so the suction strips were working. It was the, the other stuff. Yeah, it All definitely right. sucked. Yeah. Uh, Asus announced a new Xbox PC controller with a built-in 1.3-inch OLED screen above the Xbox button. Uh, that can be used for swapping profiles during gameplay, seeing your battery status, your mic status. It also can connect by Bluetooth, RF, and USB-C. You can switch controller profiles during the game with buttons at the top. No word on price, but it's promised in Q1. And BMW revealed a prototype for the iVision D concept car Wednesday. It has an e-ink panels, hey, more e-ink, that lets you change the color of the car along 32 choices. A voice assistant called D for digital emotional experience lets drivers (laughs) interact with the car by voice. One way to interact is through a heads-up display. You can control how much info is in it with a mixed reality slider. Many of the features will make it into BMW's next car platform coming in 2025. Yeah, I, that is one thing about prototypes. I go back and forth. One is like, well, this isn't real. Tell me when it's real. But the other is a lot of times you see the features. They may not all make it in, but you'll see features that will show up. And uh, someday this will be volumetric displays, and they can call it 3D. Vancouver's Gluckskind is showing off its Ella baby stroller at CES. When there is no child in the stroller, let's be clear, (laughs) no child in the stroller, it drives itself. Uh, So the idea is it stays close to you. It knows where you are and follows you so that you're holding the baby and you're not worrying about pushing the stroller around. Uh, Sensors avoid obstacles. It even senses hills and can apply brakes to slow it down when it's going downhill or give a motor assist when it's going uphill. Those work even when the baby's in. Uh, It's available for pre-order for $3,500, Rich. Good. We've seen a lot of interesting like baby and and kid tech here this is definitely one of the more innovative ones but eesh that price yeah this is the one you're seeing on cnn and your local news and and all of that you won't believe this yeah if the price wasn't so eye-wateringly high which i actually know baby strollers are pretty expensive right i mean hundreds but not thousands yeah not thousands uh i i think this i think this does solve a real problem though don't you No, like and, and this is yes it is a meets a need it is seems like checks a lot of boxes for a lot of parents definitely would be helpful but that's a big barrier to entry and it's Saray says it seems like this should be applied to luggage as well it has there there is some luggage that does this the problem is then you have to take the batteries out when you go on the plane it's mm. kind of inconvenient stuff like that yeah. uh well that's going to do it for this episode of ces uh thanks to our brand new boss jeremy who just started backing us on Patreon. Uh, Thank you so much, Jeremy, for being the person that made CES possible today. All of it, the entire show. Well, okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> our coverage of it anyway. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. If you would like to be Jeremy tomorrow, uh, patreon.com slash DTNS. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. We've got more CES stuff to talk about on Good Day Internet. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Uh, Sarah Lane has the day off. She's doing fine. We'll be back tomorrow with Shannon Morse and Nicole Lee. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>